All right. Well, I see we're starting to get people signed in. And this is Ron Kresha from Golden Shovel Agency, um, along with Tip Strategies, who will be presenting here in just a minute. We're going to give folks about another two minutes just to get logged in, and then we'll cover some introductions, some housekeeping. So those of you that have registered already and are, are sitting, um, just be patient with us for a minute or two. All right, well, welcome everyone who's registered and is sitting in uh, so far. I think we'll get a couple more stragglers, but um, this is Ron Kresha again from Golden Shovel Agency. And I'm pleased to have with us John Roberts and John Karras from Tip Strategies. They will uh, be putting together this presentation and uh, relying on their experience. We're, we've been great partners with them and, and we have a nice relationship and are able to leverage both companies' strengths. I'm very thankful that uh, they're presenting today. It seems well-timed, uh, especially in the global events that are happening, as well as um, I look back at Golden Shovel's history, and, and we made the conscious decision when we started that we would be a remote company as well. So all of this is, is well-timed and no coincidence. And with that, John and John, I'd like to introduce you. Uh, I believe you're going to have a quiz. And to the participants, if you have any questions, Please send those in through the chat line. I'll be monitoring those and I'll be bringing those in. But with that, uh, and no more ado, I'd like to introduce John Karras and John Roberts from Tip Strategies. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. And welcome to what I think is uh, a little bit of an unsettling day. And uh, as you heard, it is no, um, accident that this topic is coinciding with current events. So we're going to move through a relatively lengthy presentation and we'll interrupt it um, with some questions for you that you'll be able to answer. But let's begin with taking a look at the agenda. Uh, this is John Roberts, again with TIP Strategies. Uh, we're both in Austin, Texas. And We'll be talking about workforce trends, and then we'll be talking about remote workers specifically. And when you open the paper this morning or turned on the TV or the radio, uh, the thing that most immediately will have caught your attention, of course, is COVID-19 virus. And this particular slide we prepared for a presentation to IEDC. It's our trade organization, as most of you know, International Economic Development Council. And we posed this question back in January, early February, about how much global events would affect you. And at that time, the question seemed a little bit abstract, just sort of something we should all be aware of. Now it's a lot more than that. I've had several talks already this morning with people in major industries who um, are more than a little anxious about the market, about their customers, their verticals, not just as a result of the disruption in supply chains and travel announced last night, but also the Saudi-Russian oil trade breakdown, which I think it's at this point not at all unreasonable to be expect to be paying $1.50 at the pump. So that personalizes a little bit. The health issue is related to politics in any number of ways. In the meantime, there are international affairs that are now on the 10th page and not the first page, but uh, the UK is no longer part of the EU. 
that will have major implications for us in the economic development world. Climate change hasn't stopped just because people are getting sick. And the vulnerabilities associated with technology, which is the cybersecurity discussion, among others. But we saw it in the Iowa primary caucuses as well. That's not going to go away. And in a sense, it may increase. So this is a very uncertain time. We're going to stay on our topic, however. But we wanted to give you a larger context for these discussions and why the question of the remote worker may be more pertinent than ever. And John? Yes. Uh, not to interrupt, but uh, I think you're in the presenter mode. Do you have uh, a full screen view? Uh, we do. OK. So with that, I am going to turn it over to John Karras, who will introduce our firm, tell you a little bit about who we are and where we are, and even why we are. So, John? Um, yeah, sure. Before before we do that, um, let me make sure I get the – is this is this uh, a better mode here, uh, Ron? It's not bad. It's just that we see the notes and we see all the, the buttons, and so I didn't know if you had a way to make that full screen. Let's see here. We're working on it. <laughs> and if you don't, it's not that distracting. I mean, we can certainly uh, continue. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Okay. There you go. Sure. I think that'll and, help. And while we, okay. And and before we dive into to that, I'm going to actually uh, jump out of our our presentation for a moment and ask the audience to get ready to submit. We've got three questions for you. Uh, the the first question is sort of a background question. Uh, I think some of you have probably used a live polling tool. Mentimeter is the one that that I'm going to ask you to to go to. So. Is this, uh, can you see my screen here with uh, with the Mentimeter, Ron? Is that working? Yep, I can see it just fine. Thank okay. you. Okay, great. So the way this works is you can use your computer or your phone and go to menti.com and plug in that six-digit code, 929625. And first question, we just wanted to get a sense from the audience uh, what kind of a community are you working in? Okay, good. We see some some live results coming in. Are you in a small town, small city, mid-sized city, or are you in a large metro, either in a suburb or in the urban center? All right, good. So we've got a, looks like a pretty diverse audience with us today, a mix of rural communities, smaller towns and cities, and then a few folks in, in larger metros. And we'll, we'll give you all here another 30 seconds or so to, to fill this out. And, and this, is, this is relevant because when we talk about remote work later, we're going to use a couple of examples of, of places that are very appealing to this increasing segment of the workforce, one of which is a major metro, another is a much smaller community in not, not exactly rural, but not far from it. We'll give you another couple minutes here. So those of you who haven't logged into your Mentimeter will be able to do it. Yes. So we'll yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Why don't we go on to the next next question here? So this is a this is a big question, but just wanted to get your gut reaction, even if you haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this. But are you planning to change how you go about economic development with your initiatives and programs in response to COVID nineteen, the coronavirus, in any way, shape, or form? So yeah, um, the IEDC did a survey of, of economic development organizations, and so far your responses are are pretty much mirroring those. That it's very much a wait and see, 
and not not entirely clear what what you can do as as an economic development organization. So it seems like most of you are in that boat so far. So one more question, and then this is this will bring us back to our our main topic for the presentation. So if you had a choice between recruiting a 100 person company into your community versus recruiting 100 individual remote workers, which would you choose? Wow. This is this is an audience of economic developers, right? I thought you were all in the business recruitment business. <laughs> Very interesting. Wow, upwards of seventy percent. Yeah. So it looks like most of you would actually opt for recruiting individual remote workers rather than a single company that had a hundred workers. That's interesting. And we've, we've asked the same question in a couple of different state economic development audiences. The state of Washington, we uh, we asked them and it was half and half. This was about half a year ago. And then a few months ago, we asked a group of economic developers from the state of Texas and the vast majority said they would recruit a 100 person company. So there may be some geographic differences at play or state incentive programs that you have or maybe are lacking that also play into this, but this and is John, a, an interesting, yes. Just a question that came in on this and I wonder, do you think these results are reflecting what's happening in current events today? I mean, in other words, had we had this same presentation to this group three weeks ago, do you think the results would have been more in line with what you've seen with other groups? It's a good question. And, um, I, I actually don't think it's heavily influenced by current events um, because it, it, it's not at, at all obvious that it will be easier to get people to move during 2020 than it would be a company. So I, 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 we could discuss this for quite a long time. It's a really very good question. I, I don't think it's heavily influenced by current events, but I could be wrong. I just think yeah, the conversation is worth it. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely is. Well, well, thank you all for, for diving in and participating right out the gate. And so let's, let's go back to our, our presentation here. So just a, a very quick introduction of TIP strategies. We've, we've been around as a strategic planning firm focused on advising community leaders, cities, counties, regions, and states on economic development strategies for 25 years. And we've worked all around the country right now. We have consulting work in Montana, across to South Florida, and uh, more than a dozen different cities, counties, and regions in between. So we've, we work all over the country. And the TIP stands for Theory into Practice, because we, we try to stay ahead of uh, thinking and uh, understanding changes that are happening in the economy and the workforce and apply that knowledge as practically as possible to what what are you going to do and what, what are you going to advise your elected officials and your board members and your companies? Uh, how, how are you going to influence their decisions in your community uh, rather than than taking just a theoretical approach? And our team is is uh, we've got a, about 20 people in our firm. The, the folks on the left are the ones that, that you'll see out and about working directly with clients and you'll see us out in the field, but we have an equally impressive, maybe more impressive group of folks that you won't meet uh, for most likely behind the scenes that are involved in research and production and, and operations. So I'm gonna let John talk a little bit about some of the bigger workforce trends that we're seeing. Uh, to provide the context before we dive into the remote worker discussion. And bear in mind that as we talk about these workforce trends, we're looking very carefully at how current events may accelerate or retard some of these trends and how some of these trends really will continue regardless of what current events look like. So going to the next slide, John, 
there was a time when people's idea of work looked pretty much like this. And this is a Ford assembly line from about 100 years ago. And it, it is notable for the purposes of this webinar because these people obviously could not work from home, but it tells a bigger story than that. And the bigger story is that their manual skills were what they did. That was how the company valued them. And what we see now is a major shift, and we've really been seeing it since the advent of the semiconductor uh, in the 70s, that higher skills and education are necessary for all professions. And that structural change in the economy is data uh, supported. When you look at the percent of employment in the manufacturing sector in 1970, quarter of everyone, by far the largest employment sector, was in, man in manufacturing. And for those of you who are older or are students of history, you will know that our profession, economic development, defined itself largely through the attraction of manufacturing firms. It, it's what all of our economic modeling and everything else was based on and still is to a large degree, all of our multipliers and so forth. Now it represents only 9% and is still in decline. And what you see is this astonishing growth in uh, business and professional services in particular, but also education and health services. Now, when we talk about trends here, we have to keep in mind that the reshoring of certain industries, especially in light of the broken supply chains as a result of, of the virus um, is something to consider at the same time that oil and gas prices go down, so shipping becomes cheaper. And looking ahead at the cumulative um, change in employment by education, this is probably the most dramatic slide. Those of you who have heard us at TIP talk about this, it, what this really indicates is that uh, as a result of the Great Recession, Almost all of our job growth, almost all of our job growth has been in people, not just with higher education, but specifically with bachelor's degrees. That's what's fueled our recovery from the economy. And that trend shows no signs of declining. And that, I would say, would be worthy of a whole other topic. But it's important now because the whole idea of the remote work remote worker and all the things associated with it are in large measure driven by a new growth of a professional class. So looking ahead now to what work will look like, and this is where we start getting into the heart of our webinar. And we want to emphasize that none of this change would have been possible had it not been for the increased importance of value-added services to the traditional manufacturing. So much so that the actual manufacturing and the costs and value associated with it is now a fraction of what it used to be. The quick example I like to use, easy for us all to understand if you bought a pair of sneakers, Nikes in particular, for your teenager and you were willing to spend $100, it's worth asking yourself of that $100, what is the actual value represented by the manufacturing? And we know the answer to that. It's something on the order of $2. And does that mean that Nike gets $98 uh, of that uh, $100? No. It, well, yes, it does. But they're spending money not on manufacturing as a bigger proportion of it, but of design and marketing and financial services and a whole host of other elements to the shoe, any one of which could be far more important than the manufacturing, which by the way is contracted out in many cases. So the people who are adding value to the shoe are the people we're really focused in on at this point. So. John, if you can look at the next slide, that the environment in which this takes place has radically changed. 
But bear in mind, as you look in this slide, this slide is not what you're going to see in your co-working space tomorrow morning if you go into one. It's not going to be in the Starbucks that you go into tomorrow. You will not see this scene. It is already happening that quickly. When we go to the next slide. This is what you may be seeing. That person may still be adding value to that Nike sneaker transaction, but she will be working from home. And this was true before the current crisis. And John is going to talk a little bit about why that is uh, a little later in the presentation. So moving forward, you'll see that this um, co-working space is a way not only of supporting individual workers and their needs, which we'll be talking about, but is actually driven by large corporations who find that space valuable for them because it increases collaboration in ways that it hasn't before. But I, I want to say that uh, we will not be in a situation where co-working space or group convening ends. We, it will not end. It absolutely will not end. We will be back to this. How long it will take and what we do in the interim is important, but we shouldn't assume that the fact that Starbucks is going to be empty tomorrow means it's going to be empty in 2021. I'm very hopeful that will not be the case. So this is still going to be a relevant discussion. And uh, we want to give you a little bit of a sense of the historical trends here. And the first of it is that going to work isn't what it used to be. Because when you, when you are a major corporation, or even if you're a startup, and you think about what it is that your workers do that provides value, or if you as an individual, as someone who is not employed by a company, when you ask yourself what it is that you do that provides value, you begin to redefine the entire relationship and that redefinition of the relationship between the worker and the person who is employing the worker, or even more fundamentally, between the worker and the output, when, that, when new channels of creativity open up around that question, then the very definition of work changes. And with it, the idea of going to work changes. Uh, Karen is not on this webinar. Karen uh, is one of our remote workers, and she prides herself on being able to uh, go to work in the morning in her jammies. Uh, that's important to her. I don't know what kind of jammies they are. I don't need to know, but, uh, but it's a very important to her, and we're more than willing to accommodate that. So the office, the job, and the work are not location-based. However, however, we don't want to be blind to the fact that even as manufacturing has dropped to under 10% of the total, total employment base, those manufacturing workers are not going to stay home and do the job. So we are talking about certain occupational classifications to whom this applies. It does not apply to the retail worker. It does not apply to the EMS technician. It may, may apply to the EMS technician. It doesn't apply to the ambulance driver who has to get to the scene of an accident. So we're very aware of the fact that not all occupational classifications are affected equally. But we are confident of the fact that remote workers are generally providing a much higher level of value than the traditional work categories. So when we look at the numbers here, we see that that this change uh, has been going on steadily uh, since so about going on uh, 17 years now, excuse me, 14 years now. And, and, and that percentage is not dramatic, but it's steady. And, and this, the, the data source for this actually comes from the census survey question that asks, how do people commute to work? And about 75% of people in the U.S. drive alone. Another good percentage take transit, maybe four or five percent. Some people carpool, and then an increasing number of people, it was three percent back in 2000, didn't commute at all, meaning they were primarily full-time uh, remote workers working from home. And that number, as John mentioned, has increased significantly. And what's what's really interesting, and I came upon this by accident a few years, several years ago, all the way back in 2015, trying to understand if you've seen quality of life indices and rankings of cities, and they throw a bunch of different data sets and say, oh, the best place to live is, is some random city, and you wonder how they got to that answer. Uh, we were trying to figure out, is there a single data point that measures the quality of place of a city? 
uh, how appealing a place is. And it turned out, and this is before we knew that it was a rapidly growing trend, we kind of stumbled upon the, the data point by accident that you look at the share of people working from home among the 100 largest metro areas and how does that compare to the U.S. as a whole and to places that have far fewer remote workers. So do, does it tell us anything relevant that Austin and Denver and Raleigh have three or four times as many remote workers in their labor pool than a place like Jackson, Mississippi or Buffalo or Toledo? I think it does, especially when, when you go back to this and understand that more and more people, thanks to the technology tools and communications tools that didn't exist 10 years ago, can work from uh, many different locations, can do their work essentially from anywhere as long as they have high quality internet connection. Um, it tells you that people are voting with their feet and they're either choosing to stay in certain communities relocate to certain communities or leave certain communities. So this is a really interesting and important uh, geographic uh, distribution to understand. And uh, we're gonna speed up a little bit because we do want to leave time for your questions. We hope to learn a lot from you in this because we're curious how you're gonna to react to it. So we're gonna speed through some of these slides and, uh, and pose a number of questions to which we think uh, answers are emerging. So has the dynamic between employers and employees been disrupted? We feel very strongly it absolutely has. So this next slide, which I didn't want in there because I'm John Karras, across from me resembles the person on the right, and I guess I sadly resemble the person on the left. This dynamic cannot continue. It cannot continue for a variety of reasons. And it's partly because we understand the value of workers and the value of work in a very different way. So w we think this paradigm is broken. And we think the, the externalities, we'll talk more about that later, uh, have driven that change. Yeah, the, really, when you think about frequent job changes and less loyalty on the behalf of employers and employees, it really just boils down to it's less and less typical for uh, especially people in professional occupations <clears throat> to work in a highly controlled environment where they show up to, to work at 8 a.m. and their boss tells them what to do. It's, it's a much more flexible and dynamic arrangement for more and more professionals. All right. So um, we, we, we need to clear up some things here. And uh, it's very important that if you start looking at this strategically for your community, that we are all clear on the fact that remote workers in the gig economy are similar concepts, but they're not the same. And while they share some of the services, they're different in notable ways. So we can define the gig economy uh, with the exception of the, black, uh, the informal economy, which includes things like the black market and gray market. And a lot of people are involved in that. But the gig economy is basically non-employee compensation. And all of our data is around the way in which people are paid. So that's why we make the exception for the black market and the gray market. Those are not small things, and, but they, are self, they themselves are in, a, in flux. So for instance, California, so, uh, Northern California and Southern Oregon uh, were hotbeds of, of the black market until just a few years ago uh, with, uh, with marijuana. And so that the cannabis market has completely changed what was very much a black market activity has, has flipped. So we're aware of that and, and you need to be aware of it too. So the definition for uh, a labor market uh, in, this, in this sense is one that is characterized by short-term contracts or freelance work as opposed to people who have a, a permanent is a funny, I, I'm not entirely happy with this because no one ever had a permanent job but permanent in the sense that they have a formal relationship with a single employer. So the word freelance work leads us to another question. What, what the heck is a freelancer? And I remember living in New York City 12 years ago, riding on the subway and seeing ads for the freelancers union, freelancers unite. And it's, it's a labor organization that promotes and advocates for on behalf of their half a million members, but in support of, well over 50 million, what they, they determine, independent workers uh, around the country. 
So freelance is another way of thinking about the, the changing dynamics of the labor market. So people like my sister Tula, who is a freelance journalist, they all fit into this category. And a lot of people you know, including yourselves, may in some form be freelancers. And then there's well, what about self-employment? So uh, my wife, Cindy, she just she was a professor at UT and now she left to start her own consulting firm. So she's now self-employed. And there's currently 15 million plus uh, self-employed professionals. And if, if you take fresh books and their survey of nearly 4,000 people uh, at, the, at their word, th that could double over the next few years Absolutely. to more than 40 million people that work for themselves. They're leaving a traditional arrangement to work for themselves to become self-employed. And as, as we segue over into John's um, section on remote workers, the, the importance of this to you is the changing dynamic. And whereas COVID-19 accelerates it, it was already on track. And our argument to you is that every forward-looking economic development organization will need to accommodate for and take advantage of this growth. And the fact that it's in crisis mode right now is in a way just heightens a discussion that we would have had anyway but it will be more important for you to address it, I would say, immediately. And I do mean that I, I'm, I'm not being, uh, I'm not exaggerating by immediate, to begin to ask yourselves the questions of what supports the, uh, your community's ability to accommodate remote workers. This is not an academic question. Um, it's more than just an interesting webinar. It's something that we feel very strongly you should be doing today and tomorrow and arguably for the rest of this year. John? Yeah, so a, a lot of you have heard about the troubles with WeWork over the last year, uh, but they've, the, the idea of co-working is not new and the idea of people working remotely is, is not new as well, although it's been greatly increased by the technology tools that we've talked about. So the reason I mentioned WeWork here is their competitor, IWG, which is the owner of Regis, which you'll remember Regis, they've been around for a lot longer and never had a crazy valuation, uh, but control just as much space as, as WeWork globally. They do a survey of professionals to understand how often people are working remotely. And this is a survey uh, well over a year ago that indicated that the vast majority of professionals are working remotely at least some of the time and maybe even half of the global professional workforce is working remotely a significant amount of the time, two or three days a week. So this is something that is a big part of, of the, the current and future workforce, we believe. So we have four questions. If, if the, what the data is, is telling us is true, that it's, it's an increasing share and we need to be paying attention because remote workers are choosing some places and they're, they're not choosing other places. We have to understand a little bit more about who they are, what are the forces that are driving their growth, what's their economic value, right? I mean, if they're, uh, are, are they something that you want to attract to your community? Uh, three quarters of you said you'd rather have them than a single 100 person company. So it sounds like there, a lot of you see that value. And then if we agree that there's value to having more remote workers in your community, let's take a look at some of the places that are attractive to them now and a couple other places that are trying to uh, recruit and attract and support remote workers. So first question, who are remote workers? I think there's this perception. I know I was like this when I first read the, the book that Tim Ferriss wrote about escaping the traditional employment arrangement and becoming a self-employed remote worker. You have this idea that they're all a bunch of globe-trotting, childless uh, freelancers that are um, that are no longer tied to uh, anything, much less a job or a location. But the reality is, and I'm going back to our, our own team, uh, this is Elizabeth, she's one of our project managers who works remotely out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, she is a remote worker and so is her husband. They, they both work remotely, they, they work for a small company, TIP Strategies, and this is more re representative of who remote workers are than this this idea of a completely independent footloose uh, entrepreneur or freelancer. A lot of the people working remotely work for companies 
Um, I don't know the exact numbers on who's a freelancer, self-employed versus working for small and large companies, but a significant amount of remote workers are employed in a, in a job. They're just no longer working in a single location uh, as it used to be traditionally. So we've, we've talked about the growth. So there's a few things that are really accelerating the growth of remote workers. And again, this is before any, any impact of COVID-19. The first thing is worker preferences. We'll talk about that. It's also the practical considerations of companies are leading to more people working remotely. And then the tools that have enabled it. And we are gonna talk a little bit about how it's, it is, has become uh, a way to deal with some of the externalities. So when we think about worker preferences um, and we think about what increasingly employees are demanding of their employer and it's more and more flexibility and work-life balance. Uh, this is a, a survey that, that was done by uh, Mercer that looked at the, the top five things that people wanted out of their company and increasingly it's work-life balance. And a similar question was asked by FlexJobs, but this was geared toward just working parents. What's the most important thing that they want out of a job? Again, flexibility, even more than traditional benefits or salary. And we, when you ask people that are working remotely, if they plan on continuing, their indication is most of them say, yeah, we would like to continue doing this. So that's an indicator that they're not going away and they're not all going to switch back to a traditional work arrangement. And as you're looking at this and following along with us, uh, we, we want to keep in mind along with you, what does it mean for you in the economic development world? Why is this discussion even important? Why are we having it? And the answer is twofold. It is half of which has already been given by John. It's, it's necessary, increasingly necessary for workers to have the flexibility for personal reasons and desire reasons and the fact that a tight labor market gives them the option to make those demands. And it's of value to the company. So there are practical business needs that are driving the growth of remote work. And the flexibility and the distribution of the workforce, again, especially in light of the current situation, that make it desirable from a corporate standpoint. So the message we want to drive home, and we'll be saying this over and over, is that the forces that are pushing remote work are advantageous all around. Those industries that can do it, will do it. Those individuals that can do it, will do it. This is not a short-term trend. This is a long-term trend that requires a strategic response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and companies are doing this. I think we've talked enough about the, the need to access talent, but they're doing it to save money on real estate as well. And w one of the things that we see companies doing, we everybody's familiar a couple of years ago with the, the dual campus phenomenon on a national level, so large tech companies and other corporations are diversifying their labor footprint by opening up additional campuses. But when you look even within some of the larger metro areas, so this is our in our hometown of Austin, companies that are based here, Indeed, Verbo used to be HomeAway, they changed their name, as well as some of the tech companies, they have multiple locations. They're doing a dual campus approach just within the Austin area to accommodate the, the workforce so they can access the two different sides of the metro area more, more easily. So they've got a more flexible workforce arrangement. And that's, that has helped to support the growth of co-working spaces, which as we talked about a little bit earlier, there, it's not just freelancers and entrepreneurs, it's a lot of the large companies and smaller companies that choose to be in a co-working environment to save money on real estate, also for culture for their company. They want to be around uh, a more innovative uh, work environment. And then, of course, the one of the things that's not exactly driving the growth, it's not uh, forcing people, it's, it's really enabling it, is the technology and the tools. So the, the Zoom webinar that we're all using right now, your communications tools between coworkers, whether it's Google Chat or Slack, file sharing, these are all things that 
were not really possible as recently as 10 or 12 years ago that have allowed more and more people to do their work remotely. And we do, we do want to speed along. However, uh, it's worth keeping in mind, and I hope this is the value uh, to you in this webinar, what is it that you as an EDO can be doing around these very questions? And we cannot take connectivity for granted. We're gonna say this again. How well do you understand your broadband capabilities and range in your individual community? And more specifically, how ahead of the curve are you on a 5G approach? Are you working with Verizon and, um, and uh, Sprint and others on a 5G strategy that ensures that you have the widest possible access to 5G? Because the ability to support remote workers and the companies that use remote workers will require you not just to have good broadband, but to have 5G. Because while these can function re relatively well on 4G and to some degree even on 3G, they, there will be new technologies that will be designed for 5G. And virtual uh, reality uh, capabilities will be wholly dependent on 5G. And again, whether or not we're stuck with this virus for the rest of 2020, and we pray that it, we're not, but if we are, there will be companies who will be accelerating this move into uh, broadband uh, VR-based virtual office environments, wherever that's possible. So, um, and, and we know, Ron, and your, your team over at Golden Shovel has been looking at VR and, and trying to be an innovator within that space for a few years now. So that's something that we're more and, and more going to be paying attention and to. We've been, uh, and TIP has been promoting uh, 5G strategies on behalf of our clients. And, and John, if I could just jump into that, thank you for that. You're so spot on with that. And one thing I would just add is not only we've we been working in the VR, but we've also recently developed a VR meeting space, which would allow uh, EDOs to bring site selectors and so forth into a virtual environment and let them experience their community. Yes. Good. Yes. So remote work is, is definitely uh, gives you more options for dealing with externalities when when right. the the places that have have done this successfully they're they're I guess you could argue they're more resilient um, and we'll I'm just going to jump ahead to a couple of those examples. Um, hey John, and yeah, go ahead. I, sorry for the interruption, but we did have a really good question. Um, one person said, "Why would you need 5G in the community if it's built out with fiber broadband?" And I, I suspect other people have that. So maybe you could just talk about that, that broadband versus the 5, 5G technology and why that's important. No, it's absolutely a great question. And, and 5G rests on the, on the uh, broadband capability. But what, what th there's nothing about the broadband per se that will give you the speed unless you have the capability as a result of 5G devices. So the, the mobile device capability on 5G, uh, whatever that device is, uh, isn't, isn't given to you by virtue of having broad, uh, broadband. And so that's one answer to the question. The other answer is where, where that 5G is in a mobile environment. So you, you don't want to be tethered to a, uh, directly to the cable. And so that's where 5G comes in. And 5G, the strategy part of this is that the range of, of a 5G transmitter is relatively short. So where, where they're placed in the city uh, and the range they are in, in wherever that environment is, is going to be critical to supporting all of that super fast download speed. And, um, and, and it also allows you to hook up individual homes that may not have the broadband uh, access themselves for cost or other reasons. So it's a great question, and, uh, and, and, and I think the easiest answer is they're not by any means mutually ex exclusive. In fact, one is dependent upon the other, but the presence of broadband doesn't guarantee 5G. John? Yeah, so just to sum up, really the changing dynamics are leading to a more flexible and distributed workforce. 
But all of this, so what if there isn't a, an economic value to your community by having more remote workers? So this is just a summary. We can add more to this list. But the, the economic value and the economic development argument for uh, making your community more, I guess you could say, remote worker friendly is they're, they're going to add to your placemaking. They're going to invest in your community. The, the networking and new business creation aspects of this. Um, and one, one example, so jumping ahead to uh, a community that I think we need to talk about, uh, Bend, Oregon. There, there was an analysis that was done on uh, remote workers in Bend. They're about 12% of their workforce, so they're even more than Austin or Denver or Raleigh is, has remote workers. It actually has helped them diversify their economy because remote workers in Bend, Oregon, the ones that relocated there, uh, are in occupations that are that were currently that were underrepresented in the economy prior. So. It's, it's almost an economic diversification strategy, if you will. Uh, and they, it's the lessons from the two places, Ben being a very small community out in uh, rural Oregon and Austin being a large metro, is these are places they didn't set out to attract remote workers. It's not a, a talent attraction program per se, but these are two places that have a very high concentration of remote workers. So the question is, how are they doing it, and what's making these places appealing? Bend is the uh, its population is under 100,000, under 90 actually, and uh, and Austin's over a million now in the city and two million in the region. So, so the commonalities and differences here are very important. Yeah, and when you look at Bend, it's the connectivity that they've added to Silicon Valley and and other major markets where there's a high concentration of workers that could choose to become remote if in cost pressures and the relative affordability of, of housing. But then really the last bullet there I wanted to talk about is they have a very supportive culture all, all the way down to the point where local coffee shops and, and bars and co-working spaces have remote worker specific happy hours, just as one kind of quirky example uh, that, they, that they're doing sort of organically to respond to the needs of, of their workforce. And it's worth pointing out, and I know we're uh, pressing you on time, but it's worth pointing out that there is, and we're not talking about this in this presentation, but there's a correlation between remote, remote workers and, uh, and entrepreneurial activity. And so if, if you have a separate entrepreneurial strategy, uh, it, it will almost certainly be enhanced by the presence of remote workers and the absence of remote workers makes entrepreneurial activity more difficult. Now that's, a, uh, that's not a topic we're going to get into here, but these are linked strategies. Yeah, and entrepreneurial activities are a big part of, of Austin's economy. And I think the, and we talked about the technology infrastructure, but yeah, don't forget we were the second place where Google Fiber invested in super high speed internet. And uh, going back to the, the, the depth and diversity of co-working spaces as a, a support structure for remote workers, because yes, the census data might show that more and more people are working from home. W where do they go when they don't want to be at home? Right. And to John's point about these larger trends, uh, co-working has disrupted commercial real estate already. Even if we work goes away tomorrow, the large institutional investors and major holders of office space in every city around the country have changed the way they design and seek to fill their office space in response to this more creative co-working type of office arrangement. And this is just a couple of quirky examples of co-working spaces that are just in my part of Austin. There's one that's called Work and Woof that is just for <laughs> people that want to bring their dog to work. There's, there's one closer to where I live that's uh, focused on trying to bring uh, people that have little kids that want to play. So it's a preschool and a co-working space kind of a, uh, all together. So just as, as one quirky example. So some places are very appealing to remote workers. Um, there's other places that have struggled to achieve economic growth and attract remote workers, but are trying to attract them. So two very different lessons with uh, the state of Vermont and Tulsa, Oklahoma. 
they both put in place incentive programs that are the, the state of Vermont, it was a government policy. It was an incentive from the state government that would give people $10,000 if they relocated to the state, as long as they didn't bring their job with them. And the reason they did that was to address some of their, their talent shortages and being a, a small state with an aging population. They were the first one to do this. And the, the results were, were pretty good. They, they awarded $320,000 to nearly 100 remote workers. They got a massive amount of positive press, nearly 1,000 articles. Um, but their program, it's currently, we don't know if it's going to be reauthorized by the state legislature. So they've, they've achieved some success. Um, so a totally different story. The same program was essentially copied by uh, the Tulsa, the city of Tulsa, but it wasn't a city incentive or a state incentive. It was the George Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, and I encourage you to take a look at the Vermont Remote Worker Program, as well as Tulsa Remote, which is the same concept. They paid $10,000 to somebody that relocated from outside of the state that either took their job with them and continued working for an employer or they're self-employed. And they got over 10,000 applications for 100 spots. 25 of those people ended up purchasing property in the city, and there's, they've started to build a brand of, of Tulsa being a remote worker-friendly community, even though if you look at the data, they're close to the bottom 10 down there with Buffalo and Toledo uh, in terms of current amount of remote workers. But the program was so successful that the foundation is expanding it uh, for 2020, and their, their goal is getting at least 250 remote workers and because it's it's not uh, a, a government incentive program, they've been much more entrepreneurial in their thinking about it. And they have a spokesperson, Aaron Bolzel. He was at the IEDC conference in Indianapolis recently talking about the program. And they're, they're trying to build an, a support system uh, to make Tulsa a more appealing place for remote workers. So I think they're having some success with this. And They've already been carbon copied by Northwest Alabama, the Muscle Shoals region, Topeka, Kansas, other communities. Even economic development corporations are putting incentive dollars into play to attract remote workers because they see this as an opportunity. Now, as we wrap up, we'd like to really emphasize it's our belief, and, and we hope for some discussion on this. It's our belief that if you don't have a remote worker strategy, that you will be at a competitive disadvantage. That's our position here at TIP. That's what we're telling our clients. Uh, certainly current affairs are accelerating that need, uh, but it's not as if the things that we're facing today are going to go away. They'll appear in different forms, as John says, in relation to things like climate change. That hasn't gone away. Uh, this will not be the only virus that we're going to experience in our lifetime. And so, the point we're making is that your ability to accommodate economic disruption is greatly enhanced if you have a good remote worker strategy. So any last points on your end, John? Well, I would just say that it's more important than ever. When we look at the all-time low of people moving from their community to access job opportunities in other parts of the country, people are less and less uh, likely to leave their, where they're living now, it, but it, yet it, it makes it even more important to be able to keep the remote workers that you have or could have, as well as attract new ones to support your current employers. So thank you all for participating and forgive us for going a little bit long, not too much uh, over that we um, anticipated, but we um, would be delighted at any questions you may have right now or um, going forward, and you can reach us in Golden Shovel uh, at your convenience over the next week. We'll probably be in the office. <laughs> so, John and John, thank you very much. That was like getting a PhD in, in a topic that's so relevant today. Um, really great. Uh, one thing I wanted to add uh, from the Golden Shovel side and some things that we see uh, is when communities talk about the remote worker strategy, one thing to remember is by removing some of the uncertainty and the up, upheaval of families moving from location to location, it actually strengthens some of the educational security as well as the emotional security of a family. And my point on that is 
one thing we should remember when fa families feel safe and not always having to chase other companies around the country with relocation, it does amazing things for the next generations below them. So uh, it's an emotional side. Uh, it's a security side to what you presented today in, in the numbers. Great. Other than that, we don't have any other questions from the audience. I think you've successfully put them in a state of ponderance. And I suspect, oh, I, one just came in as I was dragging my feet. Um, would you consider this a special strategy to rural communities? And I'll let you answer that and then we'll close up the webinar. It, yes. And I think that, that the rural community question, I want John Karras to weigh in on this as well, um, is, is probably the, the, the golden opportunity here because the speed at which the urban areas are doing it could be seen as making it more difficult for rural areas. So I would say that while Bend is or isn't a rural area, it's certainly a small community. And their success with it, the huge success with it, suggests to us that anyone who is on the forefront of it in a small and rural community is going to reap real benefits. John, do you agree? Absolutely. We've, we've had a lot of conversations recently about things like does design and urban places matter in a rural community as much as it does in an urban area. And we can make a case whether it's a quality walkable district that people go for entertainment in a very small community, uh, the broadband and 5G infrastructure in a smaller community, those investments are and strategies are just as important, maybe more so for rural communities but it, very much an opportunity. And there's, there's a really extreme and quirky example of remote work in a remote place. Uh, if you wanna check out a group called Geeks in the Woods, it's a twin brothers, they had a, a tech company in Seattle uh, that was growing and they, they took a sort of a, a sabbatical work vacation and took a lot of their team with them out to the woods east of Valdez, Alaska sort of as an experiment and they were able to work remotely from there and sort of tense and enjoy the outdoors during the the day and work work remotely for some of the time and it worked out and they they experienced such an improvement in their own sort of productivity and quality of life that they have sold the company and they've relocated to uh, this remote area in Alaska to try to build up an entrepreneurial community of remote workers and professionals working in a very remote environment. So uh, if, if you can do it six hours away from civilization uh, and have some sort of remote work arrangement, then it certainly can work in a, a rural community with five or 10,000 people that has connections to uh, major metro areas, not too far, whether it's flights or interstate highways or those types of things. So yes, very important. Wow. Well, let me just express my heartfelt thanks to both of you. Uh, one of the things that I think is so important, I know in both of our companies, is bringing the best and most innovative ideas and analytics to our customers and people in the economic development space. And I know that our partnership is doing that. And what you just presented here is, again, such a nice, strong value add to the people that are on this webinar. So thank you both. Thank you to everyone. Yes, thank you, Ron. Thanks, everyone. Okay, well, have a great day and uh, wash your hands and, and be with your family. Yes, indeed. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.